Hello, I'm back to talk about Pavlovian conditioning again. <laughs> and today I'm not going to talk about anything that's particularly fun. Sorry about that. Sometimes you just have to learn these things. And in this particular case, what you, I'm going to try to uh, talk about is very, very important. In fact, it's so important that uh, professionals in the field, PhD psychologists doing research, uh, don't adequately understand these issues. So, uh, but I hope uh, after uh, listening to this uh, episode, you'll have a better idea of what's at stake. So if we may uh, go to the first slide, this... Uh, uh, reminds you of uh, something we talked about early on, uh, namely uh, that uh, in order to study uh, conditioning and learning, you have to conduct a true experiment. And uh, the ex experiment has to include an experimental condition um, because in learning, we're interested in what causes a change in the potential to respond in a particular way. You need an experimental conditioning condition uh, that has the training procedure you're trying to investigate. But you want to make sure that it is the training procedure that's causing the change in behavior. And so you need a control group that doesn't have that training procedure. So in studies of Pavlovian conditioning, the training procedure that we're interested in is some form of pairing of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. So the experimental group in inevitably is going to get paired presentations of the CS and the US. And then uh, what's going to happen to the control group? Well, some people don't include control groups. And uh, you might think that's crazy. Why wouldn't you include a control group? I was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this process of peer review, uh, scientists uh, conduct an experiment, write it up uh, uh, and try to get it published. It's submitted to a journal and then it's sent out for uh, uh, review by experts in the field. And uh, within the last year, I've gotten a couple of uh, manuscripts that uh, were uh, uh, submitted um, by reputable PhD psychologists that failed to include a control group in a study of Pavlovian conditioning. Of course, the, my recommendation was that don't publish the paper until they include the control group. So uh, including a control group is really important. Well, why is that important? Next slide kind of takes us through some of the reasons why this is particularly important. Conditioning trials involve repeated presentations of the CS and the U. Each conditioning trial has a CS and it has a US. In most experiments, you have a series of these conditioning trials. So you have a series of CS presentations, a series of US presentations. Uh, what you want to be able to conclude is that it's the pairing of the CS and US that produces the behavior change. Uh, but as we learned earlier on, repeated presentations of a stimulus can also result in sensitization. And this is especially true with stimuli that are used as unconditioned stimuli. So if, if you get a sensitization effect in your experiment, that could produce increased responding to the CS. And if it's sensitization, which was producing the increased responding, then it wouldn't be a CSUS association and you would not have an instance of Pavlovian conditioning. So you need a control group in a Pavlovian conditioning experiments that rules out the role of sensitization. Now, uh, what is the correct control procedure? Now that is, is a debatable subject and it has been extensively debated and some People have uh, made their careers on not designing the proper training procedure, but on designing the best control procedure. Uh, uh, so the, uh, the next slide shows a couple of possibilities uh, that are frequently used. Uh, one is the random control, which was suggested uh, by Robert Ruskorler, uh, 
And in this procedure, you present the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus at random times with respect to each other. So that uh, if uh, you can't, cannot use the CS to predict when the US will happen, because both events are occurring randomly. Now, the random control works in certain situations. It's generally useful if uh, in situations where learning is fairly slow uh, and uh, in situations where you can actually achieve randomness. If learning occurs really fast, if learning occurs in one or two trials, it's hard to create a random uh, pairing, uh, I mean, a random procedure. So on the, in situations like that, and in situations in general, uh, you can use what's called the explicitly unpaired procedure. So keep in mind that for conditioning, we're interested in behavior changes that reflect an association or linkage between the CS and the US. Well, if we use a procedure in which the two events occur explicitly on, at, at different times, and never together, if they're explicitly unpaired, then that linkage should, should be much more difficult, if not impossible to form. And so that's a, an appropriate control. And in fact, the uh, explicit unpaired control is the most frequently employed control procedure in studies of Pavlovian conditioning. And one of my favorite experiments uh, that use the explicitly unpaired control is shown in the next slide. So, uh, this uh, slide uh, shows uh, a, a special kind of conditioning procedure, uh, eye blink conditioning. And it's done with five month old infants, which is pretty, pretty cool because it shows that uh, you can get learning, systematic evidence of learning at such an early age. And here, the uh, unconditioned stimulus is a puff of air uh, near the eye, and, uh, and the unconditioned response is a blink. You present a tone, brief tone before the puff of air, and after a while, the infant starts to blink when the tone comes on. And in this particular uh, procedure, uh, there were two sessions of training conducted. Uh, during the first session, uh, there were 30 conditioning trials. You know, I mentioned you know, these conditioning trials are presented uh, a, a number of occasions. Here, every couple of minutes, they got the conditioning trial for 30. Uh, trials and one group of infants received the tone and the air puff paired using a short delay kind of thing. The tone came on and the air puff occurred right when the tone went off. So that's a paired procedure. The other group got an unpaired procedure. And what do you see uh, during the first session? Well, the interesting thing is you don't see much of anything. Okay. So what does that tell you? Uh, well, it could possibly tell you that the infants didn't learn anything in the first session. Another thing that it could tell you, and this is one of the reasons that I love this experiment, is that they learned something, but they're not showing what they learned. So you might recall when we talked about the definition of learning, <laughs> One of the boring things I talked to, to, uh, talked about was the learning performance distinction. That learning may occur and you may not see it uh, because your test of learning or the circumstances that don't allow the organism to display what it, what they've learned. And, and that's why the definition of learning included this phrase. It's the potential to change behavior, uh, potential to respond in a particular way rather than actual learning of a particular response. So all that may have seemed really abstract at that point, but look at this. So there's no evidence of learning in session one. Did they actually learn something? And the neat thing is the answer to that is you bet. Because <laughs> you bring them back the next session and in the first block of trials, there's a huge difference between the control group and the uh, experimental group. The paired subjects are now blinking about 45% of the time to the tone, and they quickly jump up to blinking on 80% 80, 80 of the trials. To, to the, they're blinking to the tone, so they're blinking in anticipation of the air puff that's coming, whereas the control group, which got CS and US 
uh, presented in an unpaired fashion, they, those infants continue to show very little eye blink to the tone. Well, um, the fact that you get this huge difference in session two, whereas you didn't get anything in session one, means that they did learn something in session one, but you didn't see it until uh, you brought them back uh, to the laboratory a couple of days later. So there was some kind of an incubation effect for learning. Uh, some people might re re uh, interpret that as consolidation. What you learned in session was having to be consolidated and then you can show evidence of learning the next day. So uh, it's very important to include a control group. Uh, without, without this unpaired control, we would not know whether the higher level of performance in the experimental subject uh, was due to something unrelated to the CSUS association. It could have been due to some form of sensitization. You can get sensitization to the air puff. You can get sensitization to the tone. Maybe after a while, you just, the tone starts to elicit air puff. Uh, blinks, uh, what these data show is that was not the case. Okay, now uh, I uh, told you that uh, scientists often don't include control groups. Uh, the next slide shows a really famous experiment. This is the so-called bright noisy water experiment, which was uh, conducted by uh, Robert Gar uh, Garcia uh, and uh, uh, John Garcia and Robert Cohen. It's the Garcia Culling experiment. And uh, the, this was done with rats uh, that uh, got a, a drinking tube that had either a taste of saccharin. And each time they licked, uh, a light and a, a noise went on. So uh, the licks produced both taste and an audiovisual cue. And one group of subjects was. Uh, uh, Condition with shock, so the taste plus audiovisual cue was paired with shock. And another group of subjects received the same condition stimuli, taste and audiovisual cues. And now those cues were paired with illness. And the investigators uh, uh, several days later looked to see if uh, the rats learned an aversion to the taste or learned an aversion to the audiovisual cues. And the next slide shows you the results, uh, which were rather unusual. And that's why this became a very famous experiment. If the unconditioned stimulus was illness and you tested and during the test sessions, now you're, you're presenting just the taste stimulus by itself or just the audiovisual cue by itself. And you're looking to see uh, what's the propensity for the rats to lick when they're getting these cues. If the rats got sick, they don't lick if they're getting the taste stimulus, but if they're getting the audiovisual cue, they continue licking like crazy. And they don't mind, uh, they have no response to the audiovisual cue, but they hate the taste. <laughs> if they got shock as the unconditioned stimulus, uh, they hate the audiovisual stimulus. They don't lick if they get the audiovisual cue, but uh, and they uh, for, and didn't form any kind of aversion to the taste. And uh, this uh, was uh, a very unexpected finding. Uh, the phenomenon was called the CSUS relevance effect. And it uh, was uh, considered to uh, uh, reflect uh, the requirement that in some sense, the condition stimulus has to fit with or belonging, belong with the unconditioned stimulus in order for the two events to become association associated. So it's also referred to as a belongingness effect. And uh, uh, in many ways, uh, our thinking about Pavlovian conditioning was uh, considerably uh, uh, revised based on these kinds of data uh, because they show that uh, the conditioned stimulus can't be an arbitrary cue. It can't be just anything. 
it somehow has to be related to the unconditioned stimulus. Uh, with uh, sickness, uh, audiovisual cues are not good conditioned stimulus. Uh, whereas with shock, tastes are not good conditioned stimulus. <laughs> so the conditioned stimulus has to be uh, specially selected. Okay, so it's an important experiment, and uh, uh, we'll talk more about this uh, experiment in class. But for today, what I invite you to consider is where is the control group? Where is the unpaired group? Where are uh, groups of subjects that allow you to evaluate the potential role of sensitization in this phenomenon? The answer is they didn't have unpaired controls. They didn't include control groups. And um, because they didn't include control groups and they didn't evaluate the potential role of sensitization. Uh, and these results were highly controversial and it took about 20 years of research to sort out exactly what was going on in this, uh, in this original experiment. Uh, um, by that time, <laughs> Garcia was a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a very famous scientist, but people kept, still kept hammering away at him about this possible problem of sensitization. So don't forget about control groups in Pavlovian conditioning. If you do, you're not going to get your uh, experiment published and people are going to complain. I hope not for 20 years that you haven't designed your experiment correctly. <laughs> All right. That's my story for today. Thanks for your attention.